Film Detective Podcast is back. I'm Don Stradley. With me is Dana Hersey. If you're a New Englander of a certain age, you probably remember Dana as the host of The Movie Loft. <laughs> the Movie Loft on WSBK Channel 38, a long running and influential program that we all loved. Dana, how are you? I'm good, Don, and how are you? Awesome. Awesome. Uh, it's summertime, and we're showing a lot of drive-in movies uh, on on the old film detective. Uh, do, do you have any fond memories of, of drive-ins? Oh, I l love drive-ins. I mean, I spent more time at a drive-in. I can't tell you. I mean, it was I mean, there was a drive-in at 114 in Middleton in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and there was a drive-in in North Reading, 133. And then there was another one, I think, in Georgetown. And I, uh, I, I would go travel from one to the other on the weekends. I mean, literally, I saw a lot of movies at the drive-ins. And you, know, you had that whole communal experience. Of, you had to get there early. So the, you know, later in the summer, it was really bad because the light didn't get you know, dark enough to see the picture. Uh, until you know later so they'd start the uh, the one the lesser movie first or the cartoons because they always had cartoons before and you could barely see them uh, on the screen and then there was a you know they had a short season certainly here in the northeast so what they attempted to do uh, i think it was the 114 and the 133 here what they attempted to do was put heaters in the cars along with your uh, your speaker so you put the speaker in and then you put the heater and the speakers, of course, were terrible. I mean, they were just awful. They were they crackled and they, you know, smacked and scratched and scratched and everything else. And, you know, every movie, every weekend, about two or three of them would get lost because people would drive off when they hang in the window and rip them right out of the stanchion. But uh, they were, uh, they had great memories, of course. I mean, you know, of course, there's the whole passion pit thing. I remember the, the you know, the, the refreshment stand, you know, and they had the little, Oh, the refreshment ditty that went on on the screen, and you went out, and you could get, you know, French fries and onion rings and just everything that was completely unhealthy for you. And I spent a lot of time, a lot of time with the refreshment stand at those places too. And you know, when you're 16, 17, 18 years old, you can pretty much eat anything you want. I remember uh, my highlights for drive-in memories are not actually at the drive-in. It would be coming home from say, my grandmother's house, some holiday get together in the summertime, probably 4th right. of July or, or Labor Day or something. And we'd be, I'd be in the back seat, my parents would be up front. And as we were coming down the highway, you would see a drive-in in the distance, you know, and you would see just a gigantic image of usually a Clint Eastwood movie or, or <laughs> Or a, a James Bond movie, you know, th th those seem to be the two, or, or Planet of the Apes. <laughs> those were the uh, recurring faces that you'd see, either Clint Eastwood, Sean Connery, or an ape. Uh, well, you're just that much younger than I am, because I would, I'd see people like Lee Remick, you know, Gary Cooper, and the, those people in the drive-ins as, as, as well. But that that's correct. You know, I, I kind of picked this up saying, um, I went to the drive-in when I was a teenager, driving with my, my girlfriend at the time or whatever, and I spent a lot of time there. But it's true that I also, also went to the drive-in theater with my parents to right. watch movies with uh, my parents. And ultimately, of course, I usually fell asleep before the end of the, uh, the movie was over. But I remember that as well. It's quite an amazing experience when you think about it. And, and it's I, really, uh, I, I also remember, I have vivid memories uh of the people around me there would always be like you said falling asleep in the back seat there would always be kids in their pajamas um you know their parents just thought we got to do something let's get out of the house and they would put the kids in their pajamas and, and you'd you'd see that um and by by that time uh drive-ins were also doubling as other venues they they would be used as flea markets on sunday mornings that's true yeah uh and sometimes uh rock little rock shows would go on uh if they had a big enough stage in front of the screen 
uh, sometimes bands would play there or auctions. I remember people would have auctions there or classic car shows at uh, you know, <laughs> such, such and such drive-in on a Saturday afternoon. But well, it's also true that, you know, they used to sell per person in each vehicle. So you know, always, you know, teenagers, you get the biggest car and you'd pile people into the trunk and you'd go through. And then they decided, well, okay, we're going to fix that. And they started charging per car, no matter how many people that you had in the car, they mm. charge you per car. Mm. But it, it's great. You know, uh, I have a place in Maine on Fry Island. And on the way up there, you go through Wyndham and there is a drive-in theater still to this day in uh, Wyndham, New Hampshire, Wyndham, Maine, I should say. And um, it almost went out of business about three or four years ago. And I remember seeing on the, you know, on the marquee, it said goodbye instead of the movies that they were, should have been playing in there. Uh, Thanks for the last 50 years or whatever it's say. And a group of people got together and literally saved it as kind of, I think, as a nonprofit. So it's still going. It's still going strong up there in, uh, in Wyndham because people felt, you know, it meant so much to them to have that drive-in theater there. Yeah, I don't think there's a modern equivalent of it. Uh, I think if you grow up with them, they they uh, they definitely had a big impact on you. I I recall uh, I don't remember the fellow's name, but the guy who came up with the idea for drive-ins somewhere somewhere in the Midwest. Uh, I I think it was a Midwestern guy, or maybe California. That sounds like it might have happened in California. Apparently, <clears throat> he came up with the idea because, and this sounds like a joke, but it's not, his wife was a large woman and she could not fit comfortably in theater seats. And she liked movies, but she just said, you know, I, I, I can't sit in those damn theater seats. I wish we could watch movies from a car because the car was comfortable. It was, you could lay back, you could relax. Sure. Yeah. And that was where he got the idea of watching movies from your car. And at first he was just setting up a screen. He had some property, a few acres, and he just set up a, a you know, smallish screen to see if it would fly, the, this idea. And sure enough, by, by the 50s, it was a phenomenon. Yeah. Um, and, and it's maybe, kind of a uniquely American phenomenon too, because we've had, you know, we had all these cars yeah, and everybody yeah. did everything in their cars, much like the fast food industry store, right. because people ate in their, in their cars as well. But I remember when the movie was over, when finally the last, and there was a scramble to get out of the parking lot. Now everything was built on a knoll. All the rows were built on knolls so that the cars, the cars were parked on an angle. So there were people, I just remember the, the sound, the scraping of those undercarriages coming over, those gravel berms that they was in every lane, trying to cut in here, cut in there. It was pretty amazing. You know, everybody's scraping their muffler, you know, off the uh, off the gravel to get over these berms to get out of the drive in. It was really a, an amazing communal experience. And we have very few of those today, I think. And and as as time went on, they started putting, you know, playgrounds. Uh, hmm. slides and oh, yeah, sure. you know, things like that you know so the kids if the kids didn't want to watch the movie um, or you know maybe there was still a little bit of daylight you know the, the kids could go play on the swings or um, the other thing I liked was uh, they were always a few years behind the times so in the 80s I was still going to see The Exorcist at a drive-in you know the movie was probably 10 years old by then because the movies were cheaper i mean they were che- they were not in first run so they were cheaper to yeah uh, to put up on a drive-in yeah yeah you you would be seeing things that were maybe 10 or 12 years old and we we didn't have cable or or vcrs we didn't have anything like that at that point you know so you know yeah. you could see some old movies in texas chainsaw massacre you know that was a big uh drive-in favorite I'm delighted, Don, that you're older than I thought you were. So, I mean, I'm, if, I'm it, if it's true you remember without uh, videotape machines, then you're a little older than I thought you were. Oh, I, I, I remember uh, quite a few things, uh, or at least, <laughs> at least I've read about them. Good for you. <laughs> well, also in July, uh, we have, to me, this is really kind of a big deal, July 16th. 
we have two birthdays to celebrate. Um, Barbara Stanwyck and Ginger Rogers. Mm -hmm. that, that's impressive that they, they both shared a, a birthday. And they started very young. That's what they have in common. In fact, I think Barbara Stanwyck never actually went to high school. I think she got a job when she was 15 years old dancing at uh, some, um, what, what was it, uh, some Ziegfeld, uh, summer stock Ziegfeld thing. And she never went back to school again. I mean, she went out of middle school and then that was it. Um, it, it didn't do her any harm, that's for sure. Barbara Stanwyck, as you probably know, and throughout the 1940s was not only the number one um, money-making actress uh, in Hollywood. She was also the leading female in the world. And she made more money than any woman uh, made in the world during the 1940s. Pretty amazing how, uh, how she did it too. She had a great well, career. I think Ginger was also sort of a teenage uh, yeah. prodigy. Uh, she was dancing, winning contests for you 14 know. years old, I believe. She won yeah. a Charleston contest. Yeah. And the prize for that Charleston contest was um, a chance to go into a vaudeville show, right. to create a vaudeville act, and then to travel with a vaudeville show. So, you know, Barbara Stanwyck, 15 years old. It's hard to believe that today that that would ever happen. At 15 years old, goes off. And at uh, 14 years old, Ginger Rogers, of course, she did have her mother with her. Uh, for a great deal of her career. Uh, she went off and uh, started vaudeville, had an act on uh, vaudeville. Pretty amazing, actually. I know, I think uh, I think Ginger came from sort of a, a, a bad family background where her parents were involved in an ugly custody battle and the yeah. father, the father had actually kidnapped Ginger a couple Several of times. Several times. Actually, I believe so it was probably better that she was on the road. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it, well, the sad part of that is, I think that eventually he lost uh, any contact with her whatsoever, and mm -hmm. uh, it really uh, bothered her throughout the rest of her life that that actually happened. Well, it's interesting too. Uh, Ginger Rogers won one Oscar for uh, Kitty Foyle. Kitty, yeah, Kitty Foyle. Um, Barbara Stanwyck never won an Oscar. She was nominated a few times, but she she never won one. Um, she received one of those honorary Oscars for something. And I and I, I think she also won a bunch of the uh, you know Golden Globe, uh, you know United Press type awards. I, I, she had a closet full of awards, no doubt. Um, yeah. Now, I wanted to mention that in a way, their their careers are similar in that they. They both started out as sort of musical characters, a lot of dancing, a lot of singing. Uh, and then after the war, as the movie business, as the characters started to get tougher, they got tougher and started appearing as more uh, sort of domineering women, you know, tougher characters, you know, so they- And the femme fatales. Uh, the yeah, oh yeah, well. yeah, like yeah. Barbara Stanwyck was, was great at that. She did a bunch of those. Um, In fact, but, Barbara Stanwyck made a movie called Night Nurse. You know oh, that yeah, movie? early on. Yes, early on, made a movie called Night yeah. Nurse. And that movie is considered largely responsible for what became the Hayes Commission or the Hayes Code, the Motion Picture Code. Um, is, because is, they, is that the one with Clark Gable as a yes. chauffeur and he's yes. dressed and in leather? Yes, yeah, that's right. And she... Uh, she uh, plays the movie. She has a couple of scenes in lingerie in the movie, and it was really considered. Uh, it was also had some very adult themes in it, apparently. But it's when there was a movement going on to say, okay, Hollywood is going too far. You know, somebody has to do something. Congress has to do something about Hollywood because it's becoming very immoral. And then out comes Night Nurse, and that that was it. Okay, we have to do something about this. So they said it's largely responsible for tipping. Uh, that tipping point in Congress where they uh, where they created the Hayes Commission. Well, they, they had to keep Barbara Stanwyck in line. You, you, don't, yeah. you don't know where yeah, she right. was going to go. <laughs> it didn't slow her down any, though. That's for sure. Uh, she played a lot of those uh, sort of saucy little characters, you know, and, and you know, I, I only knew her from Big Valley and the Colbys. 
So whenever I saw her in an older movie being very flirtatious, it was always kind of jarring. I didn't know that that was how she had started. That's um, true. Now but, it's funny in, in the Big Valley, she was the only character in that family that was never shot. Everybody <laughs> was remember in every one of those episodes, somebody was getting shot. She was the only one that was never shot in those uh, in those episodes. One of the one character was shot twice in one episode. So yeah, the Barclays. Yeah. Right. That's right. The Barclay. She was Victoria Barclay. That's, <laughs> that's the role she played. Right. For a long yeah. time. Very popular. Very popular show. Yeah. And that, that was the show that I knew her from. When I thought of Barbara Stanwyck, I thought of the Barclays, you know. Mm. So, it, so right. then to see Double Indemnity, where, where she's this femme fatale, that was I, that very, very uh, interesting to me. I, I became really fascinated by her. But here, here's, a, here's something that I think is really interesting. 1941. She made, I think, I think she made five or six movies that year. Three of them in 1941. One of my favorites, Ball of Fire, The Lady Eve, mm. and Meet John Doe, all right. in the same year. Now, now, if, if an actor makes three movies like that in, a, in an entire career, that's something. But she, she did it all in one year. I, I, I'm impressed by that. Yeah. Well, of course, if you were a contract player, boy, you just have to keep working. I mean, and I and I guess they would make movies like that all in one year. Yeah. yeah. Do you, do I don't think know? it's because they had I don't think it's because they had more control over the scripts, because I don't necessarily uh, think they did, uh, frankly. But do, um, do you know Ball of Fire? Yeah, I do. I know the movie. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I like that one. That's one of my favorites. It's her, her and Gary Cooper again. Right. Um, you know, she is also responsible. I don't know, think about it. She married an actor, a Broadway actor, whose name I think was Frank Frey. Oh yeah, yeah. And right. he was a very successful actor. And Hollywood, you know, asked him to come out. One of the studios asked him to come out and start, you know, start making movies, which is you know the way it normally was many, right. many years ago. Uh, stage actors would come out, and, you know, to Hollywood to make movies. Well, he wasn't very successful at it, but she married him when she was 21 years old. She came out to Hollywood with him, and suddenly everybody wanted to hire Barbara Stanwyck, but they weren't hiring him. And that, their story, their real story between that marriage really was the uh, inspiration for you know, a movie that has been made over and over and over now. And um, you know that, that line about you know, the older man marries the younger actress, the older uh, successful actor or musician as uh, sometimes, and it's Star is Born. Right. I mean, right. Star is Born has been done, what now, four times? At Maybe least. five times? Four, yeah, four or five times now. And uh, that- Not, not counting all story. of the ripoffs. Yeah, not, <laughs> exactly. Not counting those who weren't called Star is Born. Yeah, but I, it's, it's amazing that she was responsible for, her story anyway, was responsible for uh, that those movies. Well, you know, I uh, she kept going all uh, up into the 1980s. She was appearing in that TV show, The Colbys. Right. Which, uh, I I don't remember it really vividly. Uh, I'm assuming it was kind of like Dallas and a lot of those uh, right. sort of prime time soap opera type stories. Um, but she, you know, she she worked as long as she could. She was uh, one of the greats. Um, William Holden, you know, uh, actually credited her with his career, with his entire career. Well, they were in Golden Boy together. And the studio did not want Holden to be in that movie, uh, not because he wasn't a good actor, but because it wasn't a name. They wanted a name actor to do it. But she had so much uh, you know, power uh, at that time. She insisted that he be uh, in the movie and uh, it made his career. And Holden was and I think Holden actually sent her flowers every day for over a year to thank her uh, for getting him to be in that movie. Uh, and there was some, I don't know which Academy Awards it was, there was some Oscar ceremony where the two of them uh, came on stage to present an award. And William Holden gave what can only be described as a, a teary thank you uh, to Barbara Stanwyck for insisting that he play that role, which made his career. I, I, you know, I think I do have a vague memory of her 
saying something to him at some award ceremony, saying something like, you'll, you'll always be my golden boy, something like maybe. that. Maybe, yeah, maybe, and, yeah, and you're yeah. welcome. <laughs> you're welcome, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's funny, Golden Boy, I wonder, you know, that, that came out of that same actor's studio where Kazan and, and John Garfield and Clifford Odets, they were, they were yeah. grinding out those really tough dramas. Um, and and uh, uh, I wonder if, uh, you know, that was what, late 30s, early 40s? Right. Um, was Garfield, Garfield was already uh, a name, wasn't he? So, Pretty well established by that so I, point, yeah. yeah. And he had already done a bunch of boxing movies, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder if they thought uh, he might, he might have been better because I think Garfield had done it on stage. Um, no, I'm not sure of that, but it would make sense. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. Because yeah. uh, uh, Garfield was one of the, uh, you know, staples of that that actors' theater in New York, um, right. and and uh, um, so it's funny. William Holden is a bit different than. The, the type of, you know, method type of actors that they used in, in uh, the, the, that, that New York studio. He, he was more of the, uh, um, the, the, he was more of the Hollywood actor of the time, you know, mm -hmm. rather than this kind of method actor, you know, knocking his brains out to, <laughs> to, to play a, a role, you know, but yeah, I, I love slight, Will Holden. Slight build, you know, and he had, yeah, you're right. But he saw something in him, obviously. Well, it wasn't that the studios didn't want him. It's just he wasn't a name. So they, yeah, you know, it's not right. even they recognized him, but he was sort of a name. Right, right, right. Yeah, Bill Holden's another one we'll have to talk about someday. Yeah, um, I always liked him. Yeah, one of the one of the best. Uh, you know, July 1st, another birthday, Olivia, Olivia de Havilland. Now that you uh, know all done. I think um, Hello, we'll, we'll be showing a couple of her films. Um, and uh, yeah, so fans of Stanwyck and Ginger Rogers, be sure to tune in July 16th. We'll be showing a, a, a bunch of their movies. For Ginger what Rogers. Ginger picture do we have? We're showing one called Heartbeat, where she plays uh, a pickpocket. Um, and and uh, that's 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 a good good one. It's like a light comedy. She did some some real film noir type films as she got older too. Uh, in, in a way, I, I flip flop. Uh, with her and Barbara Stanwyck. I knew Stanwyck as the older, tough character. I didn't realize she had ever been this bubbly character back in the 30s and 40s, right? Right. With Rogers, I only knew her as the song and dance character. I, I So when I saw her in film noir type roles later on, uh, you, you know, she did one with Brian Keith where he played, uh, you know, your typical detective uh, involved with some bad people and trying to protect her from some bad guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that was around 53, 54. So it was quite a bit after her, her tap dancing heyday. Um, My favorite story about Ginger Rogers is, you know, she had a notorious affair with Howard Hughes. I mean, it, it wasn't an affair, it was an engagement that went on and on and on. And he was incredibly controlling. Uh, and, you know, we hired people to you know watch her all the time and spy on her uh, it was alleged that he had tapped her phone that I, I mean he was just completely paranoid uh, all the time and uh and she took it for a long while because you know, he bought her over 130 acres i think in west hollywood or up in the hills and was going to build her a big mansion and all so she kind of got involved in that whole thing and the, here's a man that's obviously an eccentric genius but um he was so controlling that eventually I mean, there was a moment that he was insisting that she go to the dentist with him, right? Except about a week before that, one of her friends had said that he saw, uh, that she saw his car out in front of another actress's house. So obviously Ginger Rogers thought he was cheating on her. So when he called to say, I gotta go to the dentist, she said, no, I'm not going to go to the dentist with you. You know, she was considering breaking up with him. So he was eventually goes to the dentist by himself and racing to get to the dentist on time. He has a head on collision and he winds up in the hospital. Right. 
So uh, the word is that the minute she found out that he was in the hospital and been in this bad accident, that she raced to the hospital uh, to see if he was okay. And she gets in the room and he's literally covered in bandages. I mean, he had like 70 stitches in his head and his face. And so he's literally covered in bandages and he can, he can barely you know, move. And she, you know, is trying to nurse him or, uh, you know, comfort him on his bedside. And he looks at her and he says, this is your fault. If you had come with me to the dentist, this never would have happened. So they get in this big fight. And eventually she breaks up with him in the hospital room after, you know, running to his aid when she found out that he had, uh, uh, that he had had a head on accident going to the dentist. That's my favorite story about Ginger Rogers. I think it's just fantastic. He, he likes those RKO girls. Was oh. he involved with uh, Catherine Hepburn? Oh, a yeah. lot of them, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think Hepburn actually came after Ginger Rogers. Yeah. Yeah. Ginger Rogers was also, I mean, is that, that famous line about her? She did everything that Fred Astaire did, only backwards and in high heels. And there's a great truth, deal of truth to that. But Fred Astaire also said of her that everybody he ever danced with always looked wrong except her. Mm. And also he said he made every, Fred Astaire said he made every, I mean, he wasn't proud of this, he was confessing this, but he said at one point he made every actress that ever danced with him cry. And it, he notoriously, he was a perfectionist and he worked, you know, real long hours and he, I mean, he had to get everything down. And of course, if you were dancing with him at the time, if you're a woman, you had to do the same thing. And he just browbeat his women to the point that every one of them, you know, broke down. And he said, except for Ginger Rogers, who never did. But Ginger yeah. Rogers was, you know, wasn't going to let that happen. Well, you know, she was one of the few that could keep up with him. He, you know, she, uh, she was no lightweight. She was a tough yeah. gal. Uh, well, did you get to make a, a pick of the month or are you going to leave that up to me? I'm going to leave the pick of the month up to you. I think. Oh, okay. Well, before we get out of here, I'm going to make my pick July 29th in, in keeping with our drive in theme, we're showing the brain that wouldn't die. Coming up, a devastating car accident results in the tragic death of a beautiful young woman. Not only that, but she's decapitated during the crash. Fortunately, the driver happens to be her boyfriend, a noted surgeon. He's already been experimenting with keeping body parts alive and plans to attach his girlfriend's head onto the body of a local stripper. As you know, all mad scientists have friends in the world of adult entertainment. And just when you think this movie can't possibly get any sleazier, it does. Jason Evers plays the doctor, and Virginia Leith plays Jan, the woman who loses her head. You're about to meet both of them in director Joseph Green's low-budget classic from 1962, The Brain That Wouldn't Die. That's, that's my pick. Despite uh, everything I said about Barbara Stanwyck and Ginger Rogers, I'm going to pick The Brain That Wouldn't Die. Great uh, drive-in movie. Yeah. It, it has everything. It, it has uh, uh, a decapitation, <laughs> car crashes. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's got a, a woman loses her head in a car accident, and fortunately, her boyfriend is a scientist, and he ah. saves the head. And uh, you can guess what he does with it. I'll leave that up to your imagination. Uh, but tune in to that one, July 29th. And there's must there's, watch. It's there's a must a, watch. There's a great monster in it because this scientist has been working on projects all along and he's he's got a he's of got course. a monster in the yes. closet, which is kind of an interesting <laughs> an interesting idea. He's got a monster Odd for a scientist. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so tune in for that one. And I guess that ought to do it for this month. Great to talk to you, Dana. And if you would, please sign us out. Don Stradley, I am Dana Hersey. Have a good day. <laughs>